Hello everyone and welcome to this week's lecture on climate change. Um, as you might be able to tell from the title of this presentation, I'm going to change it up a little bit and I'm going to rely on all of you to thoroughly read and comprehend the climate change chapter. And I'm going to focus in specifically on the carbon cycle and the impact that the carbon cycle has in driving changes in climate. Um, and this presentation is going to be very similar to a presentation that I actually taught in Water in the West at Boise State University. So if any of you ever end up going there and, and taking Water in the West, I'd be curious to know how much um, this lecture has changed over the years. Probably Sean Benner teaching it now. Um, anyways, without further ado, let's get into it. So the first thing that's important to note within the carbon cycle is that carbon is stored within a lot of things. Um, we know it's stored in the atmosphere, um, or at least you would know that if you uh, read the chapter on climate change. Um, but it's also stored in life forms, anything you know, from a plant to a mammal. Um, it's stored in fossil fuels such as coal, which is exemplified here. Um, sandstone or any sedimentary rock that ultimately comes to contain any organic matter. Soil, so uh, or, or sediment that is un um that is that is not lithified or solid solidified into a rock and then also water contains carbon um, um and we'll get into the details of that as i move on in this lecture okay so to really understand the carbon cycle you need to understand the different forms of carbon and in this case, I'm not talking about, you know, carbon existing within different things like water or sediment or humans. I'm talking about the different phases that carbon exists within, um, uh, the phases of matter. And then I'm also talking about the different oxidation states of carbon and what those different oxidation states mean in terms of the different compounds that can be formed from carbon and um, the amount of energy uh, that that carbon can release. So, you know, most people just think of carbon as, oh, you know, like CO2 carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere um, when they think about climate change, but it's important to note that it actually exists in all three phases of matter that you would find on Earth. So it exists as gas in the atmosphere. Um, obviously, you know, we've talked about that and uh, the climate change chapter talks about that a lot. And that exists um, as an in, in aqueous form in groundwater and surface water, um, in raindrops, etc. And it also exists in solid form in Earth materials like rocks and biomass. And this is really important to keep in mind that it can exist within these three forms because, you know, it's really the amount that exists in the atmosphere that impacts Earth's climate. And processes that might shift the amount of carbon that exists in the atmosphere versus, you know, the amount that exists in water or the amount that exists in solid earth materials can actually mitigate the anthropogenic impacts of pumping a bunch of carbon dioxide and methane and, and other forms of carbon into the atmosphere from, you know, industry um, and a lot of other things that humans do on earth. So just keep that in mind, um, but for now I'm going to move on to how carbon exists in multiple oxidation states. Um, 
So any of you who have taken chemistry might be familiar with all of this. Those of you who have not, um, this might seem pretty foreign to you. Um, but this is going to be important for you to understand the carbon cycle as a whole and um, how carbon can cycle into these different um, phases that we just spoke about. So um, carbon exists in three phases and it also uh, exists in a variety of oxidation states. And you can think of the oxidation state as sort of simply what is the electrical charge of carbon? Um, and, uh, you know, the most reduced oxygen state is the state where the charge is the most negative and the most oxidized oxidation state is the charge um, that is most positive. So in this case, um, if you have something like methane, um, you have carbon with a charge of negative four. And so if you combine carbon and four hydrogen atoms, then you have um, an electrically neutral compound. Or in other words, both the carbon and the four hydrogen atoms are all happy um, that their valence shells have been filled. They have the right number of electrons in their valence shells, if you remember that from an earlier lecture in this class. And you might know that that's true because you might know that hydrogen has a charge of plus one. So if you have one plus one plus one plus one, that's four. Therefore, the carbon and methane must have a charge of negative four. And then you have something like carbon within organic carbon, where it has a neutral charge of zero. And um, in this case, the compound of organic carbon is one carbon and um, two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. And uh, you might notice that that, is bas that basically means carbon H2O. So maybe some of you have heard people talk about how like humans are a super high percentage of carbon or we're made of a super high percent of carbon. And other people might talk about, oh, we're a super high percentage made of water. Well, the reason why folks are saying that is because humans are largely made of organic carbon. So you can say that we're largely made of carbon or we're largely made of water, which is interesting. Um, but you know that carbon has a charge of zero here because H2O or water um, has a charge of zero because hydrogen atoms are plus one and oxygen atoms are minus two. And then finally, you can have something that is super oxidized. Um, which is like a carbon with a charge of plus four. Um, and that sort of carbon exists in carbon dioxide. Uh, you know that it's plus four because, as I just mentioned on the, on the organic carbon um, bullet, oxygen is minus two. So you have minus two, minus two, which equals minus four. So you need a plus four from the carbon to balance that out. And... Um, these different oxidation states of carbon exist as a result of changes driven by both chemical and biological processes. So you can see in this diagram on the bottom here how you can actually um, go from methane, which is the most reduced state, it has uh, sort of the most energy from um, available for oxidative processes to the most oxidized state, uh, which is like the carbon that exists in carbon dioxide. And this ability for carbon to change between multiple oxidation states also greatly impacts climate change um, because 
uh, it means that carbon can exist as a very wide variety of compounds and, and those compounds have different impacts um, on the climate because they interact with solar energy, for example, in very different ways. All right, so now that we've talked about the different storage reservoirs for carbon and the different phases that it exists in and the different oxidation states that it exists in and what those oxidation states mean in terms of the amount of energy stored by those carbon molecules, it's important to talk about the specifics of carbon, carbon energy storage and release. Um, because this is integral to understanding the carbon cycle and how it impacts climate change. So, um, one way in which carbon can be stored is through photosynthesis um, in plants or primary producers. So, um, the chemical equation for photosynthesis is that you have uh, carbon dioxide um, molecule plus an H2O or water molecule plus light energy and that um, and, and those three elements combined combine um, to enable photosynthesis which results in the byproducts of CH2O, which if you'll remember from the previous slide is organic carbon, so building organic matter, plus O2, so oxygen is a byproduct. Um, so, you know, the reason why there's enough oxygen in the air for us to breathe uh, is actually because of photosynthesis, not because of the outgassing of free oxygen molecules um, or anything like that. Um, and then, so that's, that's a common way in which um, carbon energy is stored. And if you remember um, from the last slide where we talked about the amount of um, oxidation energy that exists um, and how the most oxidation energy exists in something that's highly reduced and the least amount exists in something that's highly oxidized. Well, carbon dioxide is more highly oxidized than organic carbon. And so therefore the process of um, photosynthesis is storing a higher energy um, version of carbon than the original carbon dioxide was, which you might imagine to be true um, <laughs> just by the fact that you're adding light energy along with water to that carbon. So to release energy um, within the carbon cycle, that's done through organic carbon oxidation um, or you know, taking that organic carbon and actually turning it back into carbon dioxide. So if you, for example, look at this chemical equation uh, next to this baby eating an apple, um, you might have organic carbon plus oxygen. And um, that undergoes a chemical process that releases carbon dioxide plus water plus metabolic energy. And that is essentially what happens um, when we eat something. And the reason why the metabolic energy is released is because you're taking um, a, a carbon molecule that is in a higher energy state, like organic carbon, and then um, reducing it into a carbon molecule with a lower energy state. And another example, of this release of energy um, uh, from carbon is if you take organic carbon and um, then uh, you have something that causes a chemical reaction that releases carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide plus water plus heat energy. 
And so that is what happens when uh, you light something on fire, believe it or not. So I think a lot of you are probably wondering at this point, you know, what does all this actually have to do with climate? Um, well, to answer that, we need to think about why carbon is tied up with people and climate change. And this is really because carbon compounds store energy. I think we all knew that to be true before I even started this lecture because that's what fossil fuels are, are carbon-based energy storage. Um, and energy is required for life. Um, however, you know, where is, where are these carbon molecules like carbon dioxide and um, CH4, which is methane, stored um, in the Earth system? Because as I mentioned previously, previously in this lecture, what matters the most to climate change is how much CO2 and methane and other carbon molecules are stored in the atmosphere um, versus stored in, uh, you know, water in liquid form or in rock or sediment um, in solid form. Um, and the reason why it is essentially when these carbon molecules end up in the atmosphere um, that impacts climate change is because carbon dioxide and methane act as greenhouse gases when they're in the atmosphere. Um, in other words, words, what they do is they take um, infrared energy that is emitted from the surface of Earth and they absorb um, that infrared energy and then radiate it back into the atmosphere. Whereas typically it might be allowed to just escape um, back into outer space. And um, so the reason why these are called greenhouse gases, as you might imagine, is because they act the same way that uh, glass might in a greenhouse where you you still have the light from the sun coming in but then when you have the infrared energy um, that is coming off of the earth's surface and being emitted back out it gets trapped and so Knowing this and understanding that this is what causes um, climate change is, you know, not only the influence of carbon, uh, greenhouse gases within the atmosphere, but actually the influence of everything within the atmosphere that might reflect incoming solar energy back into space or that might absorb outgoing infrared energy from the Earth and then um, release it back into the atmosphere, sort of trapping it. And so um, this diagram that I have on this slide looks kind of complicated, but it's really not um, if you look at it in its most simplistic form. So I'm going to kind of break it down step by step because this is sort of your, your introduction to the nuances of the carbon cycle that will explain, you know, why um, global warming is happening at the moment and why at other points in history, um, global cooling as a result of the materials in the atmosphere might occur. So on the y-axis, you can see that um, you're looking at different climate forcings here. So each climate forcing is something that exists in the atmosphere that affects climate. 
and the unit W per M squared is watts of energy per meter squared. And so each individual substance in the atmosphere that you're looking at here, you can see um, how many watts of energy per meter squared having that substance in the atmosphere in the concentration that it exists today changes um, the amount of watts of, of energy per meter squared on the Earth's surface. So the first um, uh, item on the list here is CO2, which you can see is a gas. And having CO2 in the atmosphere increases the amount of energy at our surface by 1.4 plus or minus 0.2 watts per meter squared. It says plus or minus 0.2 because that's sort of our uncertainty um, regarding how much having all that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere warms our atmosphere. You can see the next thing on the list um, are some other greenhouse gases like um, nitrous oxide, um, chlorofluorocarbons or CFCs, CH4, which as we discussed before is methane. If you combine those three very potent greenhouse gases that exist in much lower concentrations than carbon dioxide, you can see that you have a fairly substantial warming effect of 1.2 watts per meter squared. And then you can see that O3 or ozone also has a warming effect and then black carbon, which you can think of as um, effectively soot um, in the atmosphere also has a substantial warming effect. And then um, the sun <laughs> is the only other thing on this chart that has a warming effect. And so this 0 0.4 plus or minus 0 0.2 watts per meter squared is simply indicating that over the last 30 years or so, based off of sunspot data, um, there is some evidence to suggest that the sun has been slightly warmer um, in terms of the amount of solar radiation it's been sending to the Earth's surface than average. However, as you can see, um, the impact of the sun has not been nearly as great as the impact of these greenhouse gases and therefore can be ruled out as the primary cause of global warming at the moment. And then interestingly, um, some things that cause cooling are reflective aerosols. So something in the atmosphere that reflects incoming solar radiation back out into the atmosphere. So aerosols are extremely, they're basically extremely small liquid particles. Um, and then forced cloud changes. So <laughs> um, many of you might not know this, some of you might, but basically creating a bunch of particulate matter and putting it into the atmosphere sort of seeds clouds and creates more clouds in the atmosphere. And it just so happens that having that clouds are reflective forces that reflect solar radiation back out of the atmosphere before it gets a chance to make its way to the Earth's surface and warm the Earth's surface. So they actually decrease the amount of energy reaching the Earth's surface um, by these forced cloud changes from us essentially seeding the clouds. What's interesting about that is if we were to suddenly stop emitting particulate matter in the atmosphere and um, seeding the clouds, but the other gases in the atmosphere remained, um, that that could be pretty bad in the short term, actually. Um, and then land color changes. So that, again, is just related to the amount of energy, solar energy being absorbed by the land versus reflected. So if the land surface becomes lighter in color, it reflects more energy. If it becomes darker in color, it absorbs more energy. So on the last slide, we sort of so, uh, focused on the atmosphere and the warming effect or cooling effect of different um, 
chemical constituents that exist within the atmosphere. But now we're going to get back to the carbon cycle and we're going to talk about how much carbon is stored in different carbon sinks and how much carbon is transferred between different carbon sinks on a yearly basis. So this is kind of a, a modern picture of what the carbon cycle looks like. Um, all of the numbers on this figure are actually in gigatons, which denotes a billion tons of carbon. So um, this is uh, how much carbon exists in these carbon sinks and how much carbon fluxes between these carbon sinks um, in billions of tons per year. So on the left, you can see sort of uh, a conceptual model of what happens on the land as far as the carbon cycle. And on the right, you can see a conceptual model of what happens at the sea, which is, you know, it's important to remember that most of the uh, world is covered in um, seawater. And so that is a really integral part of the carbon cycle as well. <clears throat> so um, on the left, you can see that the largest carbon sinks are uh, fossil carbon, which is basically carbon that exists um, within rocks, and soil carbon. However, the vast majority of transfer or flux of carbon <clears throat> happens closer to the surface rather than down between fossil carbon and soil carbon. And um, <clears throat> that's because it takes an awfully long time for uh, soil to lithify into rock, um, for example. So um, you can see that between the soil and the atmosphere, you have a release of carbon that is uh, due to microbial respiration and decomposition. Um, whereas on the opposite side, you have uh, a flux that is storage of carbon that's caused by um, photosynthesis um, and also just flux of carbon from the atmosphere straight into the soil. Um, now, let's, let's focus on the red numbers here. So the red numbers are uh, changes to the carbon cycle that have been caused by human emissions of carbon, um, primarily in the form of carbon dioxide and uh, methane in some cases. And you can see that um, human emissions, at least at the time that this figure was uh, drawn, were about nine gigatons of carbon per year. And so that's adding that into the atmosphere and adding it into the carbon cycle. Well, where does that go on an annual basis? Well, approximately um, three gigatons of that is added to photosynthesis. So plants um, and algae, bacteria do a good job of sort of mitigating the impact of human carbon emissions, but they can only do so good of a job, right? Because um, they can only adapt so fast to photosynthesize that extra carbon. And so plants and um, other primary producers are mitigating the impacts of about a third of the carbon that humans emit to the atmosphere. And um, if we go over to the carbon cycle at, in, within the sea um, and within the atmosphere, we can see that approximately um, an additional plus two, you can see uh, the red plus two there of the carbon that is emitted by humans um, per year is um, mitigated because it uh, <clears throat> is absorbed by the ocean. Um, and so the ocean is also uh, playing a mitigating role in terms of the carbon cycle 
and human emissions. So, <clears throat> but the problem is that we're emitting nine gigatons of carbon per year, humans are, and between our plants and other primary producers and um, the ocean, uh, those carbon sinks are only able to take in about five gigatons of carbon per year. And so <laughs> we're, we're basically emitting too much for um, our earth systems to be able to adapt um, to absorb that carbon into earth's carbon sinks. Um, I encourage you to kind of take some time and, and look at this carbon cycle in greater detail because um, this is really interesting information and it's really important to understand that um, you know when we say that humans are um, largely responsible for this rapid rate of climate change that we're seeing on earth today it's not this you know sort of like really um, outlandish statement. It, it's all based on mass balance. And um, so our best understanding is that we're, we're basically emitting too much carbon into the atmosphere um, for our carbon sinks to absorb that um, added carbon. And additional carbon in the atmosphere, we know, you know, carbon such as CO2 um, is a greenhouse gas. So um, it's actually straight, fairly straightforward from a mass balance perspective. So let's look a little bit uh, closer at some of the major um, carbon reservoirs or carbon sinks on Earth here um, and where we're getting this data from because it's important to <clears throat> not just assume that whatever data you're looking at is correct. Um, it can be skewed and there can be different levels of uncertainty based on how you're collecting that data. So in the atmosphere, um, as was shown on the last slide, uh, we think that there is about 800 gigatons of carbon. And this is based off of land-based measurements um, and towers um, so that we can get measurements higher in the atmosphere and then aircraft so we can get measurements even higher in the atmosphere. In the deep ocean, we think there's about 37,000 gigatons of carbon um, and this is from actually sampling water in the deep ocean. Um, same methodology for measuring the gigatons of carbon in the surface ocean. Um, in plants and other uh, biota that uh, use carbon in the process of photosynthesis, um, our source of data is from satellite imagery as well as surface measurements. Um, the satellite imagery is really important actually because you know, the surface measurements can tell us how much different types of plants or biota store in terms of carbon. But then to actually apply that over the entire um, surface of the earth, satellite imagery um, and uh, computing statistics based off that satellite imagery is very important. If any of you, um, especially those of you that are geoscience majors get a chance to take any GIS classes while you're here at College of Western Idaho. I highly encourage it. <coughs> GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems. And so it will essentially teach you how to uh, map the world, but also how to um, make calculations based off of that imagery um, to help you determine things like, for example, how many gigatons of carbon exists within plants and biota on Earth. Similarly, um, that's how we get data for soil. For fossil fuels, um, it's estimated that there's about 10,000 gigatons of carbon 
and that's estimates from industry. So um, as you might imagine, uh, very large fossil fuel companies like ExxonMobil, for example, are pretty knowledgeable about how much fossil fuel actually exists for them to mine. Um, and then the lithosphere or, um, you know, rocks within Earth. We think that, uh, you know, there might be eight times 10 to the seventh gigatons of carbon or a totally massive amount related to the other carbon uh, reservoirs. And that estimate is based on geologic mapping. So sort of the question, uh, what are the sources of uncertainty here is really important to think about. And this is really important to think about no matter what types of data you're looking at. Um, so as far as satellites, you know, um, what is the spatial resolution of that satellite imagery? For example, do those satellites have a resolution of being able to image a square kilometer on our surface, a square meter, or is it hundreds or thousands of square kilometers that we're talking about? Usually a satellite that can give you imagery on a shorter time frame, um, like daily, gives you a much coarser image with a much, um, a much uh, worse um, spatial resolution versus a satellite that moves much slower and might give you an image, you know, monthly or so can give you a much finer spatial resolution um, data set. And then estimates from industry, you have to account for industry bias, geologic mapping, you have to account for the limits of geologic mapping techniques, sampling, you have to account for the uncertainty within the instruments that are actually measuring the amount of carbon within those samples and how many samples were taken, um, etc. So these are all just really important things to think about in general when applying the scientific method to data sets. So, you know, again, why is it really important to quantify the carbon cycle? Uh, this is because, you know, as, as we've discussed, any additional carbon that is left in the atmosphere relative to pre-industrial um, carbon levels in the atmosphere contributes to global warming. And something that we haven't talked about yet, uh, that is another really tragic impact of all this additional carbon in the atmosphere is, as I showed you a couple slides ago, some of that additional carbon makes its way into the ocean. And in aqueous form, um, carbon actually becomes carbonic acid, which means that our ocean waters are becoming more acidified. Um, and as our ocean waters become more acidified, if that happens rapidly, then a lot of organisms within our oceans aren't able to adapt fast enough to survive that. So if you read about or, or watch any documentaries on, you know, the massive deaths of coral reefs in our oceans, for example, a lot of it is actually due to rapid ocean acidification, as well as increases in ocean temperature as a result of global warming. Um, so just something to note. Um, but anyways, understanding the interactions between these sources of carbon and the sinks or reservoirs of carbon can help humans to um, make better land management decisions to mitigate uh, the impacts of or, or to mitigate um, carbon released to the atmosphere and attempt to offset the additional inputs of carbon that humans uh, add to the atmosphere. And then additionally, understanding these interactions between the source and sinks of carbon can um, 
that information can be input into numerical climate models. So what a numerical model is, is basically um, a mathematical model that mimics the real world and allows us to predict what will happen in future scenarios. So a lot of times when you hear, you know, if we, if we keep doing what we're doing in terms of burning fossil fuels, then global warming will probably be, or, you know, the Earth's temperature will probably be this much hotter 50 years or 100 years from now. Those estimates are actually generated by these numerical climate models. And for those of you who are getting into geoscience, um, numerical modeling is uh, really a, a, a popular pursuit because being able to predict what's going to happen in future scenarios is extremely valuable information, not only for climate models, but other sorts of models. So for example, um, for my other job for Idaho Department of Water Resources as a hydrogeologist, I run a numerical model in the Lemhi River Basin up near Salmon, Idaho, that attempts to predict if a water user diverts <clears throat> more water or if the climate changes in the basin, etc., what's going to happen to surface water flows and what's going to happen to the habitat suitability um, for Chinook and steelhead and other endangered uh, fish species that live in the Lemhi Basin. So now that we have a good handle on different carbon reservoirs or sinks and different fluxes of carbon between those reservoirs and sinks, there's one more thing that's really important to think about um, to form a mass balance perspective of the carbon cycle, and that is residence time. So what is residence time? It's the time it takes on average for a carbon atom, in this case, in the carbon cycle, to pass through a reservoir. So let's take the example of this. Um, let's say that this is uh, a lake, which is a carbon reservoir in this case. Let's say it's Lake Erie, just arbitrarily for an example. So if you have the flow of carbon into the lake, let's say it's coming from the atmosphere and then it's in the lake near the surface and then in the lake near the bottom and then how long does it take for that carbon that went into the lake to actually exit the lake in some way you know whether that be absorption by sediment or um, emission back into the atmosphere or um, some sort of biological process. <clears throat> it's just the average time that it takes for that carbon atom to pass through that reservoir. So the way to calculate the residence time of any reservoir or sink of carbon or of water or of any other substance of interest in the natural environment is to divide the size of the reservoir by the sum of the fluxes in or out. And um, you can make, you can only do this if you're assuming that um, the sum of the fluxes coming in is the same as the sum of the fluxes coming out, which is a fairly safe assumption in systems that are in equilibrium. However, that can be a little trickier in systems that aren't in equilibrium like the carbon cycle, which is being stressed by additional um, output of carbon by humans. But you can still get a good estimate. <clears throat> so, um, you know, as I just mentioned, normally Earth keeps these reservoirs fairly constant and um, understanding the residence time of these different carbon reservoirs or sinks can help us sort of divide the carbon cycle into fast and slow components in our minds so that we can know 
okay, like if humans start emitting way more carbon in the atmosphere, what carbon sinks or reservoirs are likely to be able to help us to mitigate those impacts? And what carbon sinks or reservoirs are going to take, you know, hundreds, thousands, or millions of years to actually mitigate those impacts at all? So <clears throat> the problem with fossil fuel burning from a residence time perspective is that it's moved carbon from the slow cycle to the fast cycle. Because if you recall, um, the residence time of, the lithos of carbon within the lithosphere is extremely long, <clears throat> which is why it wasn't even really noted in that figure that I showed you that showed all the carbon sinks or reservoirs and fluxes. And, but then we're extracting that carbon that's really like trapped in rocks for what would be a very long time and putting it into the atmosphere, which is um, the fast part of the carbon cycle because fluxes between the atmosphere and the sea and biomass are very fast. And um, then, as I noted before on that previous slide, unfortunately, the biomass on Earth and the oceans aren't able to absorb all of that carbon that's been added to the fast part of the carbon cycle. All right, so we haven't really talked about how humans are emitting carbon dioxide um, and other forms of carbon into the atmosphere. Well, really the three major ways that we've been doing this, that we've been adding these nine gigatons of carbon to the atmosphere per year are through the burning of fossil fuels, cement production, and land use change. Um, so for example, deforestation. So one thing that I didn't mention earlier that I think is important to harken back to now, I know this is a lot of information, but hopefully you can remember when we talked about the different oxidation states of carbon and we talked about how um, more reduced forms of carbon have more energy that can be released from oxidizing that carbon. If you remember, organic carbon has more energy that can be released than carbon dioxide. And that is why burning fossil fuels generates energy the same way that eating organic carbon generates energy in the same way that um, literally lighting a fire to wood um, generates energy. So just an important aside. But um, so this chart in the upper left of this slide, you can see how, uh, how human energy use has changed over time from 1800 to today, and then models that predict um, how human energy use is going to change moving towards 2100. As you can see in 1800, it was almost all burning wood. Then by the late 1800s, we almost primarily burnt coal. And then by the 19, um, the mid to late um, 1900s, it was um, mostly oil, but still a fair amount of coal. <clears throat> and also a fair amount of natural gas. And then now you can see that we're trending more towards burning more natural gas. Um, what's interesting here is that we're sort of evolving towards burning fossil fuels um, that have less carbon emissions. So burning natural gas um, isn't nearly as bad as burning coal, for example. Um, and then you can see that moving out towards 2100, um, some models predict that we're going to see a lot more energy generated by hydrogen and solar and um, perhaps start to see a decrease in reliance on natural gas as well as other fossil fuels like coal and oil. Um, Cement production pr produces a lot of carbon dioxide because cement um, relies on the rock limestone. And um, if you remember much from the sedimentary rock section of this class, 
limestone is actually primarily calcium carbonate, um, so it contains a lot of carbon. And when we create cement, a lot of that carbon is released to the atmosphere. So again, you're taking something that is trapping carbon, which is rocks, and that carbon would have remained in the rocks for a long time because that's part of the slow carbon cycle where carbon has a long residence time in rocks. And you're putting it into the atmosphere, which is part of the fast carbon cycle. Um, and then, you know, finally, land use change or deforestation uh, contributes to CO2 emissions. Um, so some of these charts on charts on the bottom of this slide here show um, the amount of energy that is produced from the burning of different types of fuels. So we can see that um, today petroleum, the burning of petroleum is producing the most energy. Um, and nuclear power and coal and natural gas, the burning of those fuels is, are producing more energy over time as well. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, earlier I mentioned that humans are releasing about nine gigatons of carbon into the atmosphere per year. And it's important to note that, that that's actually a fairly old figure. This chart shows 10 gigatons of carbon per year. If you found a chart from 2019, I think it would show that we're putting even more gigatons of carbon per year into the atmosphere as a total um, from the burning of all these fossil fuels as well as cement production. And then the land use change. Um, <clears throat> so basically what's happening here is if you uh, cut down a bunch of trees that are storing carbon, then that carbon ends up getting released back into the atmosphere. And so there, there are a lot of people who are really worried about all the deforestation in the Amazon, not only because the Amazon contains a lot of plants and animals that haven't been explored, um, and, um, you know, because it's, the most magnificent rainforest on earth, but also because you're essentially destroying this massive carbon sink that could help to mitigate the impact of burning all these fossil fuels and producing cement, etc. All right, so this figure is actually sort of scary um, if you really think about the implications of this. So a lot of folks have speculated um, within the media that, oh, you know, this whole burning of fossil fuels and humans generating more C or putting more CO2 in the atmosphere and causing climate change is going to resolve itself because we're going <laughs> to run out of fossil fuels. Um, but this chart shows um, in the purple the total amount of emissions to date of these different types of fossil fuels. And then in the blue, it shows the estimated reserves. So the reserves are how much of these fossil fuels um, we could burn and it would be profitable for a company to extract those fossil fuels and get them uh, ready for consumption. And then the yellow is the total amount of recoverable reserves, which, you know, some of the yellow can become blue as technology related to extracting and refining fossil fuels improves. So we're nowhere even close to having used all the fossil fuels that we have on Earth. So to actually, to actually um, change our behavior, it's not going to happen by default. Um, humans have to choose intentionally to switch to other uh, sources of energy to stop putting so much carbon in the atmosphere. And that can happen um, based off of uh, belief in climate change and trying to avoid that, um, implementing policies. Uh, <clears throat> and it can also happen with our wallets, right? So 
it's getting to the point, for example, where in many cases, solar energy is cheaper than energy derived from fossil fuels. Um, and I think that's going to continue to happen. And then other sources of more renewable energy are going to continue to become cheaper as those technologies continue to progress as well. Um, and as that happens, I think uh, most of us would probably agree, people will just switch to whatever the cheaper energy is. Um, so that's definitely a hope that I have. Okay, so kind of some food for thought to recap. Uh, to recap those last few slides. Um, so I want you to think about what evidence we have for the fate of fossil fuels that humans generate by, or sorry, for the fate of carbon that humans generate by burning fossil fuels, creating cement and changing our land use practices. Um, <clears throat> you know, I don't wanna just tell you um, that we're like burning so much fossil fuel and where it's ending up what evidence actually exists for this that's important to think about and it's important to keep in mind when you're having conversations with folks about the carbon cycle and climate change um, <clears throat> you know and what percent of the carbon that humans have produced has ended up in the atmosphere based off some of the charts that i showed you earlier <clears throat> You know, I discussed that it looks like only about five gigatons of carbon per year that humans produce are being absorbed by biomass and um, by our oceans. And we're producing upwards of nine. Um, so there's some more current information available at this website, and I encourage you to visit it and, and check that out. And then what happened to the rest? You know, the rest of it, got absorbed by some of the uh, faster parts of the carbon cycle um, or some of the carbon sinks that can absorb additional carbon in the atmosphere quickly. So this slide sort of zooms in on uh, the ability of oceans, which are one of the two major sinks of carbon that absorb the extra carbon that humans emit to absorb uh, that carbon. And um, one form of evidence that oceans are actually doing this is ocean acidification. So the chart here on the lower left, you can see that atmospheric carbon dioxide has been increasing since the late 1950s, which is when we began, began recording atmospheric CO2 that seawater CO2 has been increasing since the late 1980s when we started recording that, and that seawater pH has been decreasing, um, which is becoming more acidic uh, since the late 1980s when we started recording that. Um, this little box in the upper right of this slide here sort of shows the chemical transformation uh, that happens when um, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere enters into the ocean. So, um, you know, after the carbon dioxide enters into the ocean, it goes through a chemical transformation and forms carbonic acid. And then when you add calcium, which there's an abundance of calcium uh, dissolved in ocean waters, when you add that to that carbonic acid, it produces calcium carbonate, uh, which is a solid and is, uh, you know, the primary component of limestone. So my question, what will eventually happen to carbon in the oceans? Eventually, over an extremely long period of time, carbon that's absorbed by the oceans that stays in the oceans and enters into the deep ocean can ultimately um, help to form calcium carbonate and the rock limestone and trap that carbon. The only problem is that it's doing it too slowly to mitigate all of the additional carbon that humans are producing at the moment. Uh, this YouTube link that I put on the slide that I'd encourage you to look at um, shows some folks from NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration um, in the United States, 
talking about the increase in carbon dioxide and the ability of oceans to mitigate those increases um, and what they think will happen as a result of climate change. And then this slide shows um, the other uh, major carbon sink um, for extra carbon that's emitted into the atmosphere, which is biomass. So the evidence for biomass um, uptaking additional CO2 um, is primarily derived from satellite imagery. So NASA and others have satellites that um, you can basically use the satellite imagery to calculate the amount of biomass on the surface of the Earth and how that changes over time. Um, however, again, similar to our oceans, um, these charts on the right, uh, lower right of the slide sort of paint a grim picture because um, they show the oxygen concentration in the atmosphere. And this is just an example. It shows the oxygen concentration in the southwestern United States and then again in New Zealand and how um, that concentration is decreasing over time. And uh, as you might remember, photosynthesis produces oxygen and burning fossil fuels reduces oxygen. Um, and unfortunately, our oxygen concentration in the atmosphere is decreasing over time. Um, which means that essentially we're burning more additional fossil fuels than our biomass can. Uh, we're, we're producing more CO2 than our biomass can absorb from a mass balance perspective. And um, it, <laughs> I think it's important to note before I move on that the, the amount the rate at which our oxygen supply is decreasing is not a threat to humans or other life. Um, but it is just important to note um, as evidence that our uh, Earth's biomass is not absorbing the CO2 fast enough to mitigate the increases in CO2 in the atmosphere. Okay, so um, in conclusion, uh, humans are increasing the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide and methane, and this is causing our surface to warm. How is this so? Um, well, it's because carbon dioxide and methane, and I didn't talk about methane much during the lecture, but um, it's a large component of this as well, just not quite as large as CO2. Um, they're both being emitted to the atmosphere faster than carbon sinks like the oceans, biomass, and the soil can absorb that additional carbon. CO2, methane, and black carbon produced by burning fossil fuels all warm the atmosphere because CO2 and methane are greenhouse gases. In other words, they absorb outgoing infrared radiation from the Earth and release it back into the atmosphere, warming it. And black carbon absorbs solar energy and then radiates it back out in the atmosphere. As I mentioned previously, dark substances absorb and emit solar energy versus light colored substances like snow reflect solar energy. So that's why all three of those are warming the atmosphere. Uh, next week is going to be your remote field trip where I talk about applied geology um, and there won't be any uh, mastering geology assignment or, anyth or anything like that next week, just your remote field trip. And then the following week will be your final exam. Um, so please tune into office hours or send me an email if you have any questions at all. Thanks a lot. Have a great week.